All right, this is chapter three, Biopsychology of the Psychology Second Edition textbook. Um, and remember, as I said before, this is being recorded. If you uh, have a question and don't mind your voice being uh, eventually broadcast on YouTube, um, please just unmute your mic and ask the question. Otherwise, you may use the chat feature and I will read the question aloud for the benefit of everyone and um, uh, do my best to answer it. So uh, this chapter is a really cool chapter. Actually, I love the brain um, and talking about neurotransmitters and, and things like that. Uh, and it also kind of flows into the next chapter when we talk about addiction and some other things, um, why neurotransmission, why we're talking about it in this chapter uh, is important for the next chapter. Um, but biopsychology is more than just neurotransmission, right? It's uh, uh, evolutionary psychology, um, how body functions, you know, may impact a person um, and affect uh, psychology. And it and it's a uh, it's a really cool branch of psychological science. So let's get started. So um, so here, this is kind of like one of my favorite pictures, right? It's it's uh, three different types of brain scans. And, um, uh, and this is how we do a lot of uh, studying of the brain. And we'll talk about that later in, uh, in this PowerPoint. Um, but biopsychology is basically there to explore the biological mechanisms that underline our behavior, right? Um, biology can affect the way we think and behave. Um, so genetics focuses on how our genes can affect not only our psychological and physiological um, traits of a person, right? So it affects us both. Um, and here's a question. So why does one person die from a disease and another person survive, right? So that's one of the questions that biopsychology would, uh, would answer. Uh, or, try, or seek to answer. The other thing we're gonna talk about is the structure and the function of the nervous system. We'll talk about fight or flight, the, paras the parasympathetic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, um, and how the nervous sy system interacts with the, uh, with the endocrine system. So human genetics. So studying this can help us determine, help us understand the biological basis for different behaviors, thoughts, and reactions of people, right? So why do people, kind of just asked this a second ago, why do two people infected by the same disease have different outcomes? I'll give you an example, right? So Surgeon General warning on cigarettes. People have known that cigarettes, um, you know, have a lot of different health problems. As a matter of fact, um, working in in addiction treatment, I will tell you that, that there's a lot of research shows that more people die from cigarette um, related illnesses or smoking nicotine related illnesses than heroin and alcohol combined. But not everybody who smokes gets lung cancer. Why is that, right? Or emphysema. So, um, so there are differences and, and, and they wanna study that. Um, are there genetic components to psychological disorders, such as depression? Um, that's another thing that they would study. And are genetic diseases passed down through family lines? Again, another, um, another thing that would be studied. So theory of evolution. So um, pretty famous. I think most people um, have heard of this, right? <clears throat> and remember, a theory is a well-conceived set of ideas that explain phenomenon. And it is usually based in scientific research and study. And there's a lot of evidence to support a theory. Um, I'm just kind of emphasizing that because you'll see that on the exam. And uh, um, the difference between a hypothesis and a theory. So just remember that. But um, so Charles Darwin, he uh, explored the concept of inheritance through traits, right? Um, throughout generations of evolution. And 
in, a, in, in what he called natural selection, right? And so basically the definition of that is that organisms are, that are better suited to their environment will survive and reproduce while those that are poorly suited will die off. Uh, so characteristics that impact survival and reproduction are those that help protect against predators, right? So if I'm not an easy mark for a predator, whatever traits that I have, I will live long enough to pass those on. Um, and the more of those it gets passed on, the more changes there are later down in, in later generations, right? Um, those that increase access to food. Some of the studies that he did was he noticed differences in beak shape in birds and, um, and, and why the beaks were different for different birds was dependent on what food that they uh, were, were getting access to, right? And then other traits that help offspring sur to survive, right? So that's kind of like the theory of evolution. And so in evolutionary psychology, um, that's what gets studied and also the impact. Excuse me just one second. Apologize, I had to, had to cough. Um, you guys remember I still, I have that lung condition. So every once in a while it kind of um, comes up and gives me a little problem. So I apologize for that. Um, so why do certain genetic, genetic diseases cause people to die? Uh, why do they not become less common? So in the book, the, the example of, the, um, of sickle cell anemia in the book is, um, is an interesting one, right? So it, it still produces, I mean, it still persists today, um, mainly in Africa, but it, it's found in um, other populations as well. So, uh, so carriers of only one copy of sickle cell gene are thought to be immune from malaria, right? So having having some of your cells be sickle-shaped uh, sickle um, actually helps you to resist malaria. So that is an evolutionary benefit, right? In, in um, uh, in survival, right? Um, so that's why that disease would still be, um, and it's interesting we call it a disease too, because if you think about it, I mean, we're gonna call it a disease, that's how it's called, but just think about this for a second if we're using a little bit of critical thinking. If it helps a particular population survive, it's only a disease if you have more than one copy of the gene, right? So um, it's just interesting how it's uh, disease versus not disease. But it's kind of a cool example, very cool example. The other thing we want to talk about is genetic variations. Um, so, and genetic variations, it's very simple. It's the genetic differences between individuals, um, which help to contribute to um, uh, species adaptation to its environment, helps it survive. And then um, I think most everybody in here probably already knows this, but uh, you know, the uh, sperm and the egg each carry 23 chromosomes, um, which combine uh, to, to uh, form offspring, correct? So chromosome is a long strand of genetic material um, known as DNA. And uh, DNA is that helix shaped molecule. I'm, uh, there's, um, there's a picture of it in the book. Actually, I might even have a picture of it coming up. And then a gene is the sequence of the DNA that controls or partially controls uh, physical characteristics like hair color, eye color, skin tone, um, that kind of stuff, height, uh, weight actually, part of it too. Um, specific gene may code for hair color and different alleles of that gene uh, you know, will uh, affect what the color it will be. And an allele is, uh, is a gene that has multiple variations, right? And so that was a question that came in through the chat uh, that we're about to address. 
Uh, let's see. I also have a couple more questions. I'll fix you, Sydney. I got you. Um, all right. So getting back to uh, alleles. So those are different variations um, of genes, right? So let's just talk about that. See, there's the um, helix shaped DNA and that's genotype. And then phenotype is what we can see. So um, genotype refers to the genetic makeup of an individual and phenotype describes what observable characteristics we can see, right? Hair color, skin color, height, build. That's a person's phenotype, which is determined by their genotype. So here's, here's where we're gonna come with dominant versus recessive alleles. So I'm gonna take a few minutes because there was a question on this and this can get confusing. So we're gonna, um, I'm gonna take a few minutes and, and uh, try to help you through this. So the majority of inheritable traits are controlled by more than one gene um, or you know if they are, um, when they are, I should say, that is known as polygenic traits. So in other words, there's uh, several different genes that go um, to control particular traits. So some traits are controlled by one gene, right? So that would not be polygenic. Um, that would be monogenic actually, right? And so an allele can be dominant or recessive. And if we look down here at the bottom right part of the picture, this is an example of a dominant allele versus a recessive allele. And, and when they're um, describing these, they usually use um, uppercase and lowercase letters. So in this case, the dominant color um, purple for this flower is an uppercase A. So a flower will be purple if it has two uppercase A's or two dominant alleles for purple. Lowercase a represents the color white. That's the recessive allele or the recessive gene. And if a flower has both of those genes, it will be white. And if you look at the bottom picture, because there's, an, a, there's a dominant allele and a recessive allele, the dominant will take place. So if you have two dominants or a dominant and a recessive, you're gonna get purple either way. Um, the only way to get white in this particular example would be to have two recessive uh, genes. So I see two questions, so I'm gonna hit those. Oh, not questions, just thank you comments. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Um, so there are two types of alleles that we're looking at, right? There's um, heterozygous, which means consisting of two different alleles. In other words, a dominant and a recessive. And then homozygous, which is consisting of identical alleles, right? So either uh, two dominant or two recessive. Now I'm gonna stop right here for a second and see if anybody has any questions and make sure that what I've explained so far makes sense. All right, I'm not hearing any questions. If something comes up, please just let me know. Um, and maybe I did a decent job of explaining that. All right, so let's talk about Punnett squares. Um, and I think this has to do with a question that one person asked earlier about um, dominant recessive alleles. And so this is a way to figure out what an offspring might be, right? So um, if in this Punnett square, right, N represents the dominant allele and P represents the 
recessive allele um, for PKU, um, then this is what it would look like. So parent one is has dominant and recessive. Parent two also has dominant and recessive. So they both have the same genotype when it comes to this, right? Which is um, heterozygous alleles. So if these two were to mate, both with heterozygous uh, alleles, um, there's a 25% chance that their offspring will um, have the PKU phenotype. Okay, so, and if you look at this, it's kind of like, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Let me see if I can, uh, maybe I can do this. Uh, laser pointer. Okay, so if we're in this, if we're in this, uh, so if we're up here in this square, um, if these two had offspring, there's the chance that the offspring would have um, the uh, homozygous uh, allele, right? Um, and would not be an issue. Um, this offspring would have the, um, heterozygous and it would not be an issue. And this offspring would have the heterozygous. But this offspring you'll see gets both of the recessive alleles. And so that's why it's saying there's a 25% chance of expressing the PKU genotype um, in, in this example. So this is a way to use a Punnett square to um, figure that out. So here's another example. So let's say, um, oh, I see a question. Hold on one second. Let me turn off my laser pointer. All right. No worries. That's why I record the, uh, record the session. All right, so any questions on the Punnett square that I explained right here? I think in your homework and on the exam, there'll be a question that's kind of similar to this about one parent having um, blue eyes, one parent having brown eyes, um, or I'm sorry, I think both parents have um, brown eyes and the offspring has um, uh, blue eyes. So what do you guys think? Who might have an answer as to what, um, if you don't mind sharing it with your voice or in chat, what the genotype might be of both parents. If brown eyes is dominant, blue eyes is recessive, both parents have brown eyes, but the child is born with blue eyes, what might their genotype be of both parents? You're going to have a dominant one and a recessive one. Right. So and let's go ahead. Have two recessive. Right. Because so if I, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> That's what makes Zoom hard sometimes. I'm sorry. I'm going to shut up and then make sure that there is no sound for a little while before I speak up. Go ahead. You have the floor. So both parents, they would be like, uh, they would have a dominant and a recessive one. And the kid would have two res recessive ones. That, that's exactly correct. That is perfect. Uh, and the Punnett square is a great way to, uh, uh, to, to show that. And Amy, you are correct. You put in um, a, a dominant and a recessive um, in the chat. That is correct. Well, um, I have brown eyes and my ex-husband has blue eyes. My son has blue eyes, but I'll bet he has that big and little P Yeah. because yeah. yeah, but I must have big and little P so also, right. There, there's a possibility. A blue -eyed kid. Yeah. There's <laughs> yeah. a possibility, right? Exactly. Cause blue eyes is, uh, is recessive. Right. right. So, That's right. You, <laughs> so you have, yeah. you have blue eyes somewhere in your genes. 
um, yeah. but you also have brown, <laughs> so that's what right. that's what we got. It's kind of like uh, attached earlobes versus um, uh, unattached earlobes, right? And I forget which one is dominant. I think it's the attached is dominant, but there are more people with the recessive alleles. I can't remember exactly the makeup, but that's exactly it. And that's how the question will be like on the exam. And really for this part, um, having a good understanding of that is, is really my goal here. So it sounds like, sounds like you guys got it. I read an article one day and like this person found out like she was adopted in a genetic a biology class because both her parents had blue eyes and she had brown eyes. Oh no, that's not yeah. a way for a child to find out. Oh. Yeah, I heard something about it, but I, I don't know if it's true, but it, I think it can be because yeah, it's I possible. to said that in high school. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. Yeah. But it, yeah, it's weird. All right, uh, moving on. So let's talk about what a mutation is. And a mutation is a sudden permanent change in a gene. Um, often mutations are harmful, which is why whenever you hear the word mutation, it has a negative connotation to it. But not all mutations are harmful. There can be some beneficial mutations. If there's a mutation, a sudden change in the gene that actually helps uh, an organism to survive its environment, um, that would be a beneficial gene and would probably be passed on, right? So uh, mutations are mostly bad, but not always. Professor, um, the Down syndrome can be one of the mutations thing and the alteration in the gene. Yeah, uh, for Down syndrome? Yes. Um, I'm gonna take an educated guess and say that yes, there's probably some, some genetic thing there. I'm not like a, a geneticist per se. Um, yeah. So I don't wanna- I Google, don't out. worry about <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sorry so, about <laughs> No, 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 it's quite okay. It's natural to yeah. have questions. Uh, just to be honest, I'm not, you know, throughout this semester, there are gonna be times where someone may ask a question and I won't have the answer and it'll yeah, be outside. I understand. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I'm just explaining. So don't feel bad, it's all good. Um, yeah, all right. So let's talk about genes versus their, and their interactions with the environment. Um, so a couple of terms I want you to know, right? So first one is the range of reaction. Oh, actually, before I go there, let's just talk about something that you're gonna hear starting now and this is one of these um, terms that will carry forth through a lot of this semester, right? And that is the nature versus nurture um, argument, right? And so in psychology, there's a lot of times where people are looking at it, is this nature, in other words, genetic, um, some kind of makeup there, or is it nurture? Um, how the person's environment um, interacted to, um, to affect and make this individual the way they are, right? So nature versus nurture. Um, and part of that is the range of reaction. And what that term basically means, or that term of phrase, um, means that, it's, that our genes are set within boundaries in which they can operate and that environmental interactions with the genes determine on where in the range it will fall, right? So, um, so that's the range of reaction. The genetic environmental correlation is the view that, that gene environment interaction um, asserts that our genes affect our environment and our environment influence, influences the way our gene, genes are expressed. And then epigenetics is the study of the gene environment interactions and how the same genotype leads to different phenotypes. So uh, just a real quick pop quiz review question. What is a genotype? Who knows, you can shout it out or chat it in the text. I mean, uh, text it in the chat. 
What's a genotype? Genotype is what you get from your parents, right? What you, what you inherit? Yes, it is your genetic makeup, right? And obviously, yes, you would inherit that from your um, parents, yep. And what's phenotype? What it's expressed from the genotype. Right, and it's, uh, and I wanna take it one step further, it's what we can see, right? Like my brown eyes, my brown hair, you can't tell, but I'm short too. <laughs> so, right, so it's, it's the way, it's what we can see, observable characteristics. Good job, good job. All right, um, we're gonna move on to the nervous system. So before we do, I wanna make sure, are there any other questions on um, genes in the environment, genotype, phenotype, Punnett square? All right, very good. All right, so moving on to the nervous system. So the nervous system is made up of two different cells. Um, one of them, everybody knows about, everybody's heard of a neuron, right? Um, and the neuron is the basic unit of the nervous system. Um, and what's interesting, you know, in, in this chapter, there's a, there's a design of a neuron. We're gonna go over it. I'm gonna want you to know the different parts of a neuron, um, but it's a basic cell. Actually neurons, there are different shapes for neurons and there are, um, different lengths. So you have a neuron that is, you know, that goes from the base of your foot all the way up to your lower back, one axon, one neuron axon, that long. <clears throat> and then of course you have the neurons in your brain. Obviously they don't need to have as long um, of axonal connections, right? Um, but there are different tasks. And a couple of years ago when I was teaching this course and I, I um, don't have a picture of it in here, I keep forgetting to do that. They discovered a new type of neuron um, called the rose hip neuron. Um, and so we've advanced a lot in our understanding of the brain um, over, over the past several decades. Um, and even with all that advancement, we're still learning a lot more. Um, but neurons are basically responsible for the reception, um, conduction and transmission of electrochemical um, signals. That's basically our brain is an electrochemical processor, if you want to look at it that way. And then there are glial cells. These are, um, glial basically means glue. These are the um, cells like in the brain that um, hold it all together. Um, and glial cells actually outnumber neurons 10 to 1. Um, and they include Schwann cells, uh, astrocytes, microglia, um, oligodendrocytes. I always mess this one up. Oh, ola. You know what? Now that I'm trying, I can't even do it. That big long O word. Um, <laughs> I'll be able to say it as soon as class is done. That, that's always how it happens. But those are the different types of uh, glial cells. And they're all responsible for like some kind of structural um, uh, support for other neurons. That's what they do. All right. So earlier, this is what I was talking about. This is the basic design of a neuron. I'm going to uh, turn on my laser pointer here. Um, So this would be an example, we were just talking about glial cells. This would be an example of um, a type of glial cell, right? And um, what this cell is doing is, is it's wrapping um, kind of a fatty substance around the axon, um, which helps support structure, but it also increases the speed of the electrical current inside the neuron, which is um, interesting. So let's kind of go over uh, the basic parts of it. So you have the cell body, which is also known as the soma. And in the soma, you have um, the, uh, <coughs> the nucleus, just like every other cell. It's also covered by a cell membrane all the way around. And then dendrites 
these are where the receptors for the chemical messengers are, kept, are held. <clears throat> the axon um, goes all the way down to the terminal buttons, which is at the other end of the, uh, of the neuron. So um, <coughs> let's see. Uh, anything else I want to say about this? So I will want you to kind of understand uh, and know what a dendrite is, what the cell body is, what the terminal buttons are, what an axon is, um, what the myelin sheath does. Um, uh, I will want you to know those basic, uh, basic structures. Now, inside the terminal buttons, um, this is a kind of a blow up of a terminal button um, here. And inside the terminal button is uh, little sacs called vesicles. And inside the vesicles, are the actual neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are the chemical messengers within our brain. And so what happens is, uh, let me back up. I'm gonna go back to here. So you'll see here is a neuron with terminal buttons here, and it releases its um, neurotransmitters, the chemicals into the synaptic gap, which is gonna be explained on the next page and it binds to receptors on the neurons. And once enough binding occurs, there's an electrical charge change that occurs within the neuron called action potential. And what that action potential does is it shoots an electrical signal down the axon to the terminal buttons. And when it reaches the terminal buttons, then what it does is uh, that electrical signal has the vesicles merge with the cell membrane, you see here, the vesicles will head down, merge with the cell membrane and release the neurotransmitter into the synaptic gap. So this picture, one of my favorite pictures, because this is really cool. So this is a terminal button blown up, I don't know how many times, right? Using an electron microscope. And what you see here this is the outer edge of, of the vesicle. So the vesicle wall has merged with the cell membrane. And this inside here is the um, neurotransmitters and they're basically being released. So that's how it's released. Once it's released, it, it goes across the synaptic gap where it binds to receptors on the receiving neuron and which starts that whole electrical process all over again, which shoots down the axon to the next terminal button and so on and so on and so on. Uh, it's actually, and it moves, obviously it's very, very quick um, and it's replicated. Well, I hate to even put a number on it. I'm gonna throw a number out there, but don't count me on it. I'm just trying to explain that there's a lot of activity, millions of times, right? like seconds, like constant, constant motion doing this. As you're listening to my voice, that's exactly what's happening in your head right now. Neurons are firing off, releasing those chemicals um, uh, so that you can understand what I'm saying. When you turn off your, uh, micro, uh, your mute button and speak, so it allows you to do that, allows you to process what's being um, said and done, right? So that's, uh, 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 that's the beginning of neurotransmission there. I'm gonna stop here um, and ask if there are any questions. Um, okay, so the dendrites and the terminal buttons look very similar. Do they do the same thing or is the function different? So, in, in a way, yes, they do look very similar, but they do have two different functions. So the dendrites are what will receive the chemical messengers from the other neuron. 
And the terminal buttons is what stores the neurotransmitter and releases it into the synaptic gap. So yes, they look similar, um, but they do do two different things. Any other questions? All right. Kitty had a question. All right. Um, let's see here. All right. Next slide. All right. I kind of said this already, but I'm going to go over this, the first part again. But neuro, neural communication is an electrochemical event, right? So your brain is an electrical chemical processor. That's how it works. And neurons are surrounded by an extracellular uh, fluid. I don't know if, if uh, <clears throat> normally when we're in class, I actually pull out brains, not real brains, but model brains, um, and pass them around. And we, we kind of talk about different aspects of it. Um, but one of the things that's really interesting is that your brain um, is actually very soft. It's very pliable. Um, you have uh, like your temporal lobes. Um, if, if you could see my brain being removed from my head right now. Um, hold on one second. I'm trying to. All right. Um, you could actually pull my temporal lobe. It's very soft and mushy. And yeah, your brain is very soft, right? Um, but it's, uh, it's contained inside an electro, uh, uh, extracellular fluid and inside the cell is intracellular fluid. And the communication of the electrical signal depends on these fluids being electrically different. In other words, having different charges, um, having negative charges versus um, uh, positive charges. And so that's how it works. Now I've posted a couple of videos um, in the Canvas portal that I highly encourage um, you to watch. Uh, it kind of explains the process um, in, a, uh, in a dynamic way and you can kind of see um, uh, action potential being demonstrated. Um, so what's in these fluids are different ions, right? So there's a sodium ion, there's chloride, there's potassium, and then there are negatively charged proteins. And so before a neuron fires, it's at, um, it's, it's basically at its resting potential. So it's waiting to be activated, right? And so the state of readiness of a neuron's membrane potential uh, between signals is about negative 70 millivolts. I do not believe I have that question on the exam, so I don't expect you to know that. What I do want you to understand is that it is change in polarization that um, causes uh, action potential to either um, occur or not occur, right? So when it's at resting potential, the actual membrane is polarized, right? So the charge inside the neuron is more negative than outside. So here's an example, right? So um, the net charge inside, oh, here, let me turn on my highlighter, sorry, uh, my laser pointer. So if we're looking at this side right here, this is inside the membrane, inside the neuron, and it is mostly negative charge. What is outside the neuron in the extracellular fluid is mainly um, a positive charge. So you see there's uh, sodium um, ions, which are positively charged, and chloride ions, which are negatively charged. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so at resting potential, the sodium is more um, highly concentrated outside the cell, outside of the neuron. Let's 
Let's see what. I thought it was gonna. Hold on, I'll pop it ahead for a second. Okay, that's where we're going. Um, the potassium, which is the K-positive purple squares, um, are more highly concentrated near the membrane inside the neurons. And so other molecules such as the chloride um, ions, those yellow circles are negatively charged. The proteins, which are the brown squares are negatively charged. Those are the A's, right? Um, help contribute to a positive net charge um, in the uh, extracellular fluid and a negative net charge in the intracellular fluid. I know those terms get really in and out, in and out. So any, any questions or any, um, but you need me to slow down or re-explain something. Yeah, I got a question. In the figure, there's one blue inside. Would that mean they connect, they join together? That's how they do it, right? They separate? Um, yeah, that so way. in here, right. So this is an example. So, so outside there are more sodium ions. That's what this is representing. You may still have some sodium ions inside. And you do you see where the black arrow is? That is... Yeah. Um, I believe that's called the sodium, it's a channel, I just might have the name wrong, uh, the sodium ion pump, um, and I might have that wrong, but that is the channel that is um, used to move the ions back and forth between the um, inside and outside of the, um, of the cell. So that's how it becomes um, more, uh, more positive inside or more negative, depending on the movement of the ions through these channels. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. All right, so this is action potential and you, and, and you will need to know, or at least be able to recognize um, what action potential is. Um, and that's why I posted a, a couple of videos to kind of enhance your reading and what we're talking about tonight. So neurotransmitters from neuro, nearby neurons, right, they attach to receptors um, on the dendrites, causing the membrane um, potential to change, right? So there's, so remember at resting potential, the membrane is polarized. When when the receptors on the dendrites um, become activated from the neurotransmitters, then the membrane will depolarize, right? So the, member, the membrane potential becomes less negative, making the neuron more likely to fire. In other words, this is an, um, an excitation um, of the neuron. Hyperpolarization is the opposite. That's where the potential becomes more negative making the neuron less likely to fire, and that's inhibitory, right? So you have excitatory and inhibitory. Um, those terms you will hear again in the next chapter when we talk about um, uh, drugs of abuse and, um, and different chemicals, uh, reactions inside the brain, whether something is excited, excitatory or um, uh, it inhibits. Um, so those are the two things that, that um, I want you to know there. So in the second part of this, if the level of the charge reaches the threshold of excitation, right, an action potential will occur. And so the ion channels will open, causing the sodium ions to rush inside the cell. So if I go back to that, um, if I go back here, so right now the arrow is pointing outward, but when, um, when action potential begins, that arrow actually goes in the opposite direction and all of the, um, well, not all of them, but a lot of these will rush inside the neuron um, causing the action potential. So I kind of just wanted to pop back and show you the importance of that channel. Hmm. <laughs>
So the threshold of excitation is the level of the charge at the membrane in the membrane that causes the neuron to become active. Action potential is the electrical signal. So when I, sometimes I, I, I said, you know, the electrical signal travels down the axon. When I say that, that's action potential. Um, and then the other thing about action potential is it's an all or none principle. Uh, the, income, the incoming signal is either gonna be sufficient to turn that switch on or it's not, right? So it has to reach a level, uh, a certain level in order for action potential to occur. If it doesn't, then it won't happen. It'll just remain at its resting potential. And so this is an example of, of, um, of the chart, right? So if we, here, let me turn on my laser pointer. So remember resting potential is at negative 70 uh, millivolts, right? So this is resting potential. At negative 55 millivolts, that is the level that needs to be achieved in order to reach the threshold of excitement for the, um, for the neuron. So once it reaches that potential, it can shoot all the way up here to positive 30 millivolts and then go back down. And what's interesting is this looks like a wave and that's how it is um, actually portrayed. It's like the electrical signal is like a wave through the, uh, across the membrane. All right, any questions before I start talking about reuptake? So in the case of the people with dementia and they start doing like Alzheimer principles, they might be something different that is not acting that uh, um, vibrate of them. You know, I, yeah, I do not know. Um, and there's still a lot of <clears throat> questions about dementia. You know, it's unfortunate with the study of dementia is we might be able to see some external signs. We might believe that someone has dementia, but an actual diagnosis can only be done post-mortem. When you take the brain and you dissect it and you oh. see the plaques, right? Okay. Um, and so there's still a lot of mystery as to what that does. And so plaques are like buildup of proteins like in the brain and the overall and my information is not, may not be all that recent. Um, again, it's a little bit outside. But what I do know is that there's still a lot of mystery around it. They don't know exactly all the mechanics around it. But yes, it does inhibit neural function at some point, right? Which is why people have memory loss and why they may have uh, um, uh, some of the other I'm trying to think of some of the other. Uh, the Alzheimer? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, not recognizing faces or people, right? All of that happens because of neurotransmission. So what the breakdown is, I can't answer, but there's obviously some breakdown, right? Oh, oh okay, I thought with the MRI that kind of, the image that you show at the beginning, that's kind of one of the clues that you guys can see as a, psychologists, white people may be then transition for losing memory, stuff like that. Yeah, and there may be some more accurate ones today that they're doing. I know they're making lots of advances. I just don't have the specifics. Um, you know, um, and, but I am pretty sure that, that my last statement about the actual post-mortem diagnosis is still accurate. I don't know that there is a brand scan um, not, I'm not saying there isn't. I'm just not sure that there is one right now that can confirm. Yes, this is actual. You have plaques. This is a, this is this is what's happening, right? So I just don't have that answer. All right. Thank so you. you're welcome. You're welcome. So here in this um, uh, picture, we see the. Um, this is the presynaptic um, neuron. This is the postsynaptic neuron. 
This is the one sending the signal. This is the one receiving the signal. And then this is the, uh, there's actually a couple of different names for this. Uh, it's called the synaptic gap um, or, the synap or the synapse, this area, or the synaptic cleft. You'll hear it described um, at least three different ways. They're all interchangeable. So if I say synapse, this is what I'm talking about. And that's the area between the two neurons. And what's interesting is, is um, the neurons themselves actually don't touch. Um, there's a gap and the neurotransmitter transverses the gap to uh, reach the receptors on the other side. So what happens to the, re uh, to the neurotransmitters after they've done their job? So they, they move out of there, they uh, attach to the receptor, the next neuron experiences action potential and moves on. So what happens with the neurotransmitters here is they either hang out here for a little bit longer and maybe reattach. Um, they get broken down by enzymes um, or they get taken back up into the presynaptic neuron um, and repackaged for use again in vesicles, right? And that process of, um, of being taken back in is called reuptake. And, um, and reuptake is, uh, you'll see that again too, certain drugs are known as uh, reuptake inhibitors. And a reuptake inhibitor means that the, that the substance will sit on the reuptake pump basically, block it, which leaves the neurotransmitter in the synaptic gap longer to work. So I'm thinking of like a SSRI, which is used for um, depression, right? SSRI stands for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And so it's designed to sit on there um, so that the serotonin can stay in the synaptic gap to give it a chance to work longer and create action potential um, thereby reducing the effects of depression. Um, so anytime you, uh, and we'll talk about reuptake inhibitors again in the next chapter as well, um, as well as agonists versus antagonists, um, drugs. All right, so any questions on reuptake? All right, good. All right, so neurotransmitter is a chemical messenger of the nervous system. I think I've been <laughs> kind of beating that in. Um, now, here's the thing I haven't really said yet that I will say now is different neurons release different types of um, neurotransmitters. So you have dopamine um, neurons. You have neurons that release uh, norepinephrine, serotonin, acetylcholine, beta endorphins. Um, there are a lot more um, uh, neurotransmitters that in, in the brain and in your body than I'm gonna really talk about right now, right? Um, you would learn them in a, in a whole semester course on um, biopsychology. Um, and we're just kind of reviewing, hold on one second. Looks like we have a question in the chat. I apologize, when I'm using my laser pointer, my cursor doesn't wanna to work to select things. So then I have to, um, oh yes, Zoloft does do that. It, it is an SSRI. <laughs> yes, that is correct. Um, somebody was making a comment on reuptake inhibitors. All right, so uh, anyway, as I was saying, when it comes to neurotransmitters, um, there are way many more than we're really going to get into this semester. Um, we're just giving you kind of like the basic uh, views. So the biological perspective in psychology um, is the view that psychological disorders like depression and schizophrenia are associated with imbalances of one or more neurotransmitter systems. Um, and also other physical aspects of the brain as well. Uh, so we'll be, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in 
chapters 15 and 16. All right. Any questions on neurotransmitters, neural communication? All right. All right, so let's talk about drugs. Here's the problem with drugs. Drugs work. <laughs> and right now what I'm really talking about are those psychotropic uh, or psychoactive drugs. Um, and I'm specifically at the moment thinking of um, drugs of abuse, cocaine, marijuana, alcohol, uh, methamphetamine. The reason why those drugs work is because their molecular structure uh, mimics or very closely resembles the molecular structure of natural um, neurotransmitters that we already produce in our brain. So I add um, methamphetamine into my system and it's going to impact my dopamine receptors and release way more dopamine than um, would normally be released which is why the high is so intense and why it can be so addicting. That kind of a drug is known as an agonist. An agonist drug is a drug that mimics or strengthens the effect of a neurotransmitter. So it acts, it, 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 like I said, it mimics it or it strengthens it. It's, it's like, um, like the meth example I just used. Um, it strengthens the effects of the neurotransmitter because it releases so much dopamine at one time into the synaptic gap. Um, an antagonist drug is one that blocks or impedes the normal activity of a neurotransmitter. So um, agonist and antagonist drugs are prescribed often to protect, or I'm sorry, to correct neurotransmitter imbalances. For example, the SSRIs, that I used as an example a moment ago. Um, so since an SSRI would be used to cor correct serotonin imbalance by blocking the um, reuptake inhibitor or by um, blocking reuptake, inhibiting reuptake, which kind of drug do you think it would be? Is that an agonist drug or an antagonist drug? I can shout it out. What do you guys think? Antagonist. It's an antagonist drug. Good guess. But it's actually an agonist. And the reason why it's an agonist is because it is mimicking or strengthening the neurotransmitter. So let's go back and let me show you what I mean. So if we look here, looking at this example again, um, so the neurotransmitter gets released, it comes down here, it does its job, it tries to go back in, and it can't get back in. If it can't get back in, then it's going to stay here and reconnect again, and again, and again. So in other words, it's strengthening the, um, uh, it's strengthening the um, effect of the neurotransmitter. Does that make sense? Because it totally makes sense why you guys um, guessed antagonist. Very natural guess to go to. So it's kind of one of those situations where it's a little tricky, right? Now, let me explain the difference of how it would be an antagonist. Let's say instead of sitting on reuptake, it actually sits on the receptor. In that case, if it sits on the receptor, then it blocks the um, effect of the uh, neurotransmitter. So that's why if it blocks the receptor, it's going to, and it sits there, then that is, um, 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 would be an antagonist. It might, it might not shoot off. But other drugs that are antagonists would sit there and um, would fire off. So it's a little, it's a little tricky, I know. Oh, sorry, somebody's trying to speak. Go ahead. Meth, meth does that over time, doesn't it? What's that, meth? Yes. 
meth is a little bit of a different creature. I'll tell you why. Because meth um, is similar enough in structure that it will actually sit on the receptor and um, also and uh, fire off. But meth also has a way of getting inside. It goes up through the reuptake channels and actually bursts the, um, uh, the vesicles, releasing all of that stuff all at once. So it does it a couple of different ways. Meth is actually a very nasty drug, very nasty drug. Um, it does a it it does a lot of <laughs> it does a lot of damage up there. The good news is is that the brain, um, and we're going to talk about this as well, is um, very what they call plastic or it has neuroplasticity, so um, it can repair itself. But um, alcohol is another one of those drugs that is a very nasty molecule because it it gets in everywhere in the body and causes a lot of damage. Um, but meth would be an uh, would be an agonist because it increases the effect of uh, of dopamine. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What's Oops. an example of an antagonist? Uh, an antagonist? Oh, an example of it. Um, hmm. I'll have to think for a second. I don't have an example right off the top of my head. That's okay. What about naloxon? Is that an antagonist? That is, I believe that is classified as a partial agonist, um, which is a whole nother category. Um, oh. uh, and, and here's I mean, why now, that meant naltrexone. That's right. Yeah, yeah, naltrexone. Is, uh, yeah, I knew what you meant. Yeah. Um, for opioid, for MAT, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That is a partial agonist because what it does is it, uh, let me go back to. Well, not, the, not like Suboxone, just clean naltrexone. Well, then you know what? I should shut up before I speak because I may conflate the two. Here's what I'll say. One of them, <laughs> one of them is a partial agonist, right? Where right. it sits on the receptor and actually yeah. does cause it to fire off but at a much weaker, it doesn't have the strength of it. And because it's sitting there, if I put heroin into my system, heroin is blocked from getting to the, uh, fr from to the, I believe it's the mu receptor, right? right. The opioid receptors, right? So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just might be complaining the two. I think, uh, I think now now Jackson is an antagonist. I'm pretty sure. I've yeah, and, and you know what? You may be correct. You may be correct. But what that tells me is you do understand the difference between antagonist and agonist, which mm -hmm. is really the point of um, where I wanna go tonight. Um, does anyone else have any other questions on antagonist versus agonist? So think of agonist as it makes the, it makes the effect of the neurotransmitter stronger and an antagonist blocks or impedes the normal activity of a neurotransmitter. And I wasn't expecting a pop quiz. <laughs> good job. Um, all right. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. You know, it's funny. I work in the field, right? But I don't do MAT. And when you don't do something yeah. for a while, right? You know, that old axiom, if you don't use it, you lose it. <laughs> right. right? Yeah. Um, and uh, so it's just been a while since I've kind of like uh, actually dealt with that. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So here's the different parts of the nervous system. So it's divided up into two parts. You have the central nervous system, which um, has the brain and the spinal cord. That's it. And then you have the peripheral nervous system, which has all the nerves that go out through the rest of your body. Um, you know, from the spinal cord, down your arms, down your legs, to your feet. And in the peripheral, okay, so it might be easier if I just go here for a second. <laughs> so let's just talk about the subdivisions. So you have the um, <coughs> nervous system, right? The central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. 
The peripheral nervous system is then broken down into the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system, which is, and then the autonomic nervous system is further broken down into the sympathetic versus parasympathetic, okay? So I kind of wanted to show you this slide. I'm gonna go back to this. So the peripheral nervous system, as I demonstrated in the other slide, is made up of two different parts. The somatic nervous system, and that's what uh, relays sensory and motor information to and from your brain and spinal cord from the central nervous system, right? So as you're, I don't know what you're doing, but if you're touching your table right now, um, that sensory is going, those sensory information going up to your brain. And then if you wanna move your hand, the motor information is coming right back down. The autonomic nervous system is what controls like your internal organs um, and your glands, right? So you don't have to worry about digestion. It kind of does it, right? You don't have to worry about your heart beating. It kind of does it. Your breathing where yes, you have some control over it, but it really is kind of um, controlled automatically. Like we can breathe without having to think about it. Does that make sense? So that's the autonomic nervous system. And underneath that are two more um, breakdowns, right? So there's the sympathetic nervous system, which is the emergency. That's the fight or flight. So if you get scared, startled, this is the uh, system that um, uh, gets activated, right? Because it prepares you to either defend yourself or it prepares you to, uh, to flee, right? Um, and it, uh, well, there's another slide that shows you all the different things that it does, but um, your heart will beat faster, your pupils will dilate, your digestion will slow, um, things like that. Um, the, parasympath the parasympathetic nervous system is probably where everybody is right now, right? Your average routine, day-to-day -day operations of the body under relaxed conditions, right? Um, kind of think of it as like housekeeping. So think of the sympathetic and nervous system as emergency, I'm in trouble, it's fight or flight, and the parasympathetic nervous system as housekeeping, what your body does normally. They're kind of like the restore, rest and restore responses. Um, it will help your body relax after, after fight or flight, things like that. Any questions on those four different breakdowns? And then again, um, this is just kind of to help visualize that breakdown. So again, just real quick. So we have the nervous system, which is broken down into central and peripheral. And peripheral is further broken down into somatic and autonomic and autonomic is further broken down into sympathetic and parasympathetic. So just kind of a quick review. All right, so here's what the autonomic nervous system does. So on the uh, right side, let me turn on my laser pointer. On the right side, this um, describes your housekeeping, right? Um, your pupils normally are constricted, you know, react normally. Um, you'll, uh, your digestion will be uh, stimulated, which starts with salivation. Your heart rate will return to its resting um, heart rate. Your bronchi, which is inside your lungs, will constrict. Um, bladder will constrict, which will, um, you know, give you the sensation that you need to urinate or whatever, right? So that's your normal normal day-to-day -day activities. And this is just some of them, right? This is, um, and what's on the other side is the opposite of these when you are in fight or flight. So when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, your pupils will dilate. Why do you think your pupils will dilate? Who wants to take a guess? I think, uh... Uh, to see better, I think. Exactly. To, to see better, yeah. uh, to get more information. Exactly. 
Um, why do you think you get dry mouth, right? When you get really nervous, you get dry mouth. Yeah, that, that's indication that, that like you're sympathetic. Heavy breathing? What's that? Like a heavy breathing or something? No, actually that's a good, that's a, that's a good guess because your, your bronchi do get dilated, right? Um, so that your, your lungs can take in more air for oxygen to, to uh, get transported to your muscles. But the reason why is because salivation is the beginning of the digestion process. When we're eating, we salivate and the breakdown of food actually begins there. So it's part of digestion. Um, and since digestion is inhibited during fight or flight, um, salivation is inhibited. Um, but good guess. So uh, your heart rate will increase to pump blood faster and faster so that it can get to the muscles so that you can respond. Um, and it inhibits the contraction of the bladder, um, you know, the rectum and all that stuff so that you don't have to go to the bathroom, right? You're just uh, focused on uh, survival right there. Um, there are other things that happen. Um, you know, some people will get, uh, you know, the, the goosebumps and things like that too will happen. All right. Any questions on, on the autonomic nervous system, fight or flight, rest and restore? I do kind of want you to be familiar enough with this to be able to answer some questions on the, um, on the exam, right? But there'll be multiple choice. So uh, if you have a basic understanding of this, you sh uh, recognition should help you uh, with the answer as well. All right, let's talk about the brain and the spinal cord. So the brain is uh, bilateral. That's one of the things I'm, um, and we're gonna talk about uh, lateralization and and other aspects of it here in a moment. Um, it can also be divided up into uh, distinct lobes. Um, so you have the parietal lobe, you have the temporal lobe, you have the uh, occipital lobe and the frontal lobe, which actually can be broken down even further into the left occipital, right occipital, left temporal, right temporal. You, you kind of get the idea. And the different lobes of the brain they all interact with each other and they also have different specializations as, as we will see. And the spinal cord is designed to deliver messages to and from the brain. Um, and uh, it also has its own systems of, of reflexes. Um, let's see, what else do I want you to know on here? So sensory nerves bring messages up into the brain and then motor nerves uh, send messages back out of the brain. I don't know if you guys have, if anybody here has Netflix, but there's a really go, good show called, uh, oh, I forget the name of it, Human on the Inside or whatever. Uh, and they, uh, there's, it's about an hour long and it gives a really good um, uh, some really good diagrams of action potential, uh, neurons um, and the nervous, and the, and the nervous system, it's really, really cool. Uh, questions come in, what medications are used to level out your nervous system? Um, so I, I'm not sure about the, so when I see here nervous system, nervous system has to do with neurons. So any medications that would, um, uh, that would have, the only thing I can think of are the ones that would affect neurotransmission um, and, but since I'm not a doctor and I don't do prescribing, it's kind of difficult for me to answer that question um, per se. Uh, you know, I might have some examples like the Zoloft or, you know, other SSRIs, um, things like that. But uh, that, that works to um, uh, enhance the neurotransmission imbalance. So... Sorry, I couldn't answer that better. All right. Um, 
All right, so in moments of survival, the automatic reflexes allow motor commands to be initiated without sending signals uh, from the sensory nerves to the brain first, allowing for very quick reactions. So think about if you're cooking and you accidentally put your hand on the stove, right? That is one of those automatic reflexes that, um, that just happened. And this is, this is an example of, of what this particular area is talking about. So those sensory nerves, you know, those, those um, reflexes work um, because it's even quicker than sending the signal to the brain to pull your hand back. All right, so lateralization was a thing that I just talked about uh, a moment ago, right? So there are two hemispheres to the brain, right? There's the left hemisphere, which controls the right side of the body and the right hemisphere, which controls the left side of the body. So it's actually opposite, right? So that's why if somebody has a stroke and their left side of their body is um, somehow impaired by that, then we know that whatever occurred, occurred in the right hemisphere, right? Um, and we'll talk about, well, we'll talk about that in a minute too, about research. This is how we learn things about different areas of the brain, um, sometimes through accidents, um, as in the example of Phineas Gage, which we'll talk about, um, strokes, tumors, things like that. Uh, oh, wait, did I go too fast? I want to make sure I got... Yeah, that's it. All right. <clears throat> so what connects the both sides of the brain um, is what's known as the corpus callosum. And um, that connects, that's a, that's a bundle of nerves that connect the right side to the left side so that the left brain can talk to the right brain and pass information back and forth. Um, so in this picture here, this is actually a picture of a sheep brain and they've kind of pulled it apart, um, one hemisphere from the other and you can see the corpus callosum kind of right in there. Um, and here, oh, hold on one second. Let me turn on my laser pointer. So this is where I was talking about here. This is where the corpus callosum in is. And in the human brain, that's this structure right here, but it goes across, right? So the corpus callosum would go across both sides, to both sides. The other thing about, so we talked about lobes of the brain. Now we're going to talk about, uh, going to back out from it a little bit and just look at it from an even broader perspective. Um, so we have the hind brain, which uh, begins with the top of the spinal cord, the cerebellum, the pons. Um, this is where a lot of our autonomic uh, uh, stuff happens, right? Um, breathing, heart rate, temperature, that kind of stuff. Then we have the midbrain, and then we have the forebrain. Um, and the forebrain is actually the newest part evolutionary, evolutionarily speaking, it's the newest part. So it'll be important for you to kind of be able to recognize those divisions of the brain. Um, and so, you know, looking here, let me go back here for a second. So this is the forebrain, right? And I just said that it's the, the newest part, evolutionarily speaking. And what it is contains is it contains the cerebral cortex, which is designed for higher level processes, right? Um, the thalamus, which is uh, for sensory relay. Um, the hypothalamus, which helps control homeostasis, which is a term that I'm gonna want you to use. No, um, I believe it's coming up in a future slide, but basically homeostasis is the body's effort to um, maintain balance. So your temperature set point, um, those kinds of things. 
and then the pituitary gland, which is the master gland for your endocrine system, and the limbic system, which is your uh, emotions and memories. So that's all in the largest part of the brain, um, in the forebrain. And the forebrain is also divided into four different lobes, right? So again, this is the cerebral cortex um, or the forebrain, and it's divided into four different lobes, actually eight if you consider left and right side, but so we have the occipital lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and the frontal lobe. Frontal lobe is where is where our judgment comes from, um, reasoning, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, parietal lobe is involved with like spatial reasoning. And I'm just giving the basics. Actually, you know, there's lots of different things these areas of the brain do, um, but I'm just kind of giving you the main thing. Um, temporal, uh, has some language components as well as, as hearing. The frontal lobe also has some language components to it as well. The Broca's area is actually located on the frontal lobe. Um, and it's the Broca's area that allows you to speak. And the Wernicke's area, uh, which is located on the temporal lobe, um, is what allows you to understand the words that I am using. Um, the occipital lobe is all about sight, it, which is interesting, right? So your eyes are in this area of your head, um, but the processor for your eyes is all the way in the back. Uh, so just a little interesting fun fact. Um, so the motor cortex is, uh, is <coughs> cortex that's involved in planning um, and coordinating movement. And the motor cortex, I'm gonna go back here because I'm gonna show you where it's at. The motor cortex is actually at the back in this area of the frontal lobe. Uh, the sensory cortex is in the front of the parietal lobe right next to the motor cortex. So this is where all the sensory information comes in. And then this is where all the motor information um, is, is derived and sent out. So up through here, sensory, down through here, uh, motor. I kind of wanted to show you that on the, on there. Um, and the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, which is, uh, would be right in this area, is what is responsible for higher level um, cognitive functioning. Earlier, you heard me mention the Broca's area. So that's in the left hemisphere on the um, frontal lobe. Um, I should probably just have this, oops, here. So the Broca's area is about in this location. Um, and that is what is essential for language produ production. Um, I'm sure you guys read in the book about Phineas Gage. So earlier, remember, I talked to you about um, ethics and doing research. So obviously, it is not ethical to open up someone's head and damage parts of their brain to figure out what happens and what different parts of the brain um, control what in the body, right? So, uh, but when accidents happen, such as what happened to poor Phineas here, we learn things about the brain, or if somebody has a stroke, um, we learn things about the brain because of the type of damage, unfortunately, that was done. So in this case, Phineas, he was working um, on a railroad and a spike um, shot up through his, up into his face, behind his eye and up through the top of his head, which impacted um, his prefrontal cortex um, in the left hemisphere, right? So it passed through his eye, passed through the top of his skull. And um, let's see, do I have, uh, no, I don't. I don't have any further explanation. So I'll just tell the rest of the story. So what was noted afterwards was that his personality had changed, his behavior had changed. And um, 
And so that was one of the ways that we determined that damage to the frontal lobe or affects, um, can affect judgment, behavior, emotions. And that's how we learned about that, um, where, where different things, um, uh, sorry, my uh, broker's area just stopped. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, one of those tip of the tongue things, you wouldn't want to say it, um, but that's how we've learned what different areas of the brain um, control um, through unfortunate accidents like this. And also through experiments on, on um, other animals like rodents, for example. So the somatosensory cortex, right, um, is uh, divided up. And this is if you had cut your, sliced your brain, right? Um, so that information comes to different parts of, of the uh, somatosensory cortex, right? So this controls swallowing, chewing, salivation. You can kind of um, go through here and see all the different um, areas and where those nerves, uh, where those impulses go. So damage to any one of these areas might impact, you know, uh, facial movements, right? Hand movements, things like that. Uh, or I'm sorry, not movements. I, I misspoke, totally misspoke. Um, sensory input, I should say, because this is on the parietal lobe. So I apologize for my misspeak. The, um, the motor index um, would, would have that effect, and that's on the frontal lobe. Okay. So earlier I pointed out the Broca's area. This is on the frontal lobe. The Wernicke's area, which is on the parietal lobe. And in most people, about 97% of people, um, this is on the left side. There are 3% or they estimate 3% of people in the world that actually have it on the right side, which is kind of interesting. Um, but for most people, it's on the left side. So damage to the Wernicke's area, this area here, results in difficulty understanding what somebody is saying to you. Um, and again, damage to the Broca's area would, would uh, impact your ability to produce speech or words. And um, the auditory cortex is located here on the temporal lobe, which actually kind of makes sense since your ears are located in this area. Unlike the eyes, which are located here and the occipital lobe, which is in the back. Um, all right, so the occipital lobes involved with visual processing um, and uh, the left side and the right side uh, go to opposite eyes. So you'll see that here in just a second. Well, I thought it was on here. All right, well, we'll move on to the thalamus. I think it pops up later. The thalamus serves as the relay center for the brain. So all of your um, information comes in through here and the thalamus is designed is, um, designed to process and route the information where it needs to go within your brain. And then the limbic system, very fun system, um, is involved with mediating emotional response and memory. Um, the amygdala, which is located here, is involved in our experience of emotional, of emotion, um, tying emotions to our memories. So the stronger uh, an emotional response that you have in a memory, the stronger your memory is gonna be is what they have found. It's also involved in processing fear. Um, so when you're afraid, your amygdala will light up. Um, your response might be anger as a result of that fear. And uh, the hippocampus is the structure that's associated with learning and memory. Um, and in particular spatial memory. 
And then your hypothalamus, um, uh, I think I pointed to the wrong thing, I'm sorry. Your hippocampus is here, which is associated with learning and memory. And the hypothalamus, which is here, which is what regulates homeostasis, right? Including your blood, blood pressure, appetite, um, heart rate, um, breathing rate, appetite, all of, all of those autonomic systems that, uh, that we were talking about. All right, let's see here. Looks like we have a question. Okay. Answer, asked and answered. I apologize. Whenever the laser pointer is off, my on, I mean, my uh, cursor doesn't work right. So I have to turn it off to get to the chat. All right, so then we have the midbrain, um, which contains the uh, reticular formation, which is important in uh, regulating your sleep and wake cycle, arousal, alertness, uh, motor activity, right? So that's where uh, that, is um, located right here in the midbrain. Um, the substantia nigra is where dopamine is produced and it's also involved in the control of mo movement. And then the ventral tegmental area, the VTA for short, um, is also an area where um, dopamine is produced and this is associated with uh, reward, um, mood and addiction. So it's the VTA that really gets activated a lot in addiction. It's the pleasure reward, a part of the pleasure reward process in the brain, um, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. Because um, why is a pleasure reward wire, hardwired into our brain? Why is it important? And we will talk about that. The bandula, yeah. <laughs> Um, controls your autonomic re responses, such as uh, breathing, blood pressure. Um, the pons is what connects the brain to the spinal cord. And it's also uh, engaged in regulating brain activity while you sleep. And the cerebellum is um, related to our balance, our coordination, movement, motor skills. Um, and it is thought to be important in processing some types of memory. I remember when I was younger, the belief about the cerebellum was that it was only, um, it was only really related to movement and coordination. And now studies are indicating that uh, the certain types of muscle that it's involved in, it, uh, muscle, I'm sorry, memory that's involved in is like some procedural memory, learning, um, like muscle memory, things like that. Um, so the cerebellum plays a bigger role in memory than what we knew years ago, which is kind of cool. Uh, any questions so far? I know I've actually gone through probably too many slides before stopping for questions and my apologies on that. But you guys have been pretty good at sending chats and things, so. All right, not hearing any. Uh, let's talk about some brain imaging. Um, so first we have the CT scan, which is the computerized tomography, and that involves um, x-rays um, uh, passing through varied uh, densities in the brain, right? So a CT scan, um, this is a healthy brain right here. And then this is a brain that um, there's a tumor right here that's been indicated uh, in there. So that's the CT scan. Then we have the, um, the PET scan, right? Um, and this involves injecting individuals with like a mildly radioactive substance, right? And what that does is that it actually monitors changes in blood flow in different regions of the brain. And by the way, you know, there's this um, myth that says that we use only about 10% of our brain. That's actually not true. We actually use all of our brain. Um, every part of our brain, there's always some kind of activity. 
sometimes lower activity than, um, at times than others, but we actually do use 100% of our brain. I think when people say that, they're actually referring probably to our frontal lobe and maybe our cognitive processes and abilities, but I'm still not sure I subscribe to that myth. Um, uh, so this is really good in showing different activity, right? So, um, and then the MRI or the magnetic resonance imaging, and there's also the F MRI, which is the functional um, magnetic resonance um, imaging shows uh, changes in metabolic activity. Sorry, was that somebody? All right, looks like we got a question. Oh, that's a good question. The question was asked, is that the fluid that they inject you with to make you feel super, super warm and helps things more visible? Um, I'm going to take a guess that that's probably yes. Uh, sounds like maybe you've experienced that. Um, uh, but I don't know exactly what it is. I just know that it's, well, if it's mildly radioactive, it might make you feel warm. But I honestly don't know the answer to that question. But that's interesting. Interesting question. Thank you. Um, all right, so the fMRI is really good at showing uh, metabolic activity. Um, and so this is where they uh, can hook you up and then have you perform certain activities to, um, uh, oh, I'm getting an answer. So the answer is yes, fMRI, it is a contrast they inject to enhance images. It's not radioactive. Um, and somebody here worked in MRI. Thank you very much. That's very cool. I love it when students can share real world experience. That is so awesome. That is so awesome. And we get a question answered. All right. Um, but, uh, I, but I got thrown off. So the fMRI is really good for um, showing metabolic activity, right? And uh, showing what parts of the brain are activated during particular activities. And I think I'm, and then there's the um, EEG, which also shows electrical activity in the brain. Um, actually, I actually did this over at SDSU. They have a research lab. It's kind of cool over there. So if you ever go to SDSU, you have some research activities. It's kind of, it's kind of fun to participate. They hook you up and, and uh, have you do different activities and they, and they measure the results. It's really cool. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the endocrine system. Uh, and so what this is, is this is a series, this is a series of glands that produce hormones that regulate body functions, right? Um, so the pituitary gland serves as the master gland. Um, and it controls all the secretions of the other glands, glands, sorry. Your thyroid gland um, secretes um, thyroxine, which is regulated in growth and metabolism and appetite. So mine gives me a lot of appetite, but really affected my growth. That was a joke, but um, boom. Um, the adrenal gland secretes hormones that are involved in stress response, right? So if you're in the fight or flight mode, this is where adrenaline would come in. And then um, gonads secrete sex hormones for uh, sexual reproduction and sexual motivation and behavior. And the pancreas secretes hormones that regulate blood sugar. Oh, and that was it. I thought I had one more slide. All right, so I'm gonna stop the recording and then we're gonna talk about the exam real quick. And then I'm gonna let you all go.